Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Tonight I want to talk to you very simply about being led by the Holy Spirit. Just being led by the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul said that it was his job as a minister to cause people to obtain and be led by the Holy Spirit. He says, why should not the dispensation of the Spirit the spiritual ministry whose task it is to cause men to obtain and be governed by the Holy Spirit be attended with much greater glory than when the law was given. Think about that. It's my job, and I believe any minister's job, to teach people, of course, all of the Word of God, but to teach people how to live a life where they're filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. Literally, filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. And I want to encourage all of you all throughout this weekend and really every day of your life to pray that you will be filled to overflowing with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, the world is in desperate shape. And when people get around a believer, there needs to be an overflow coming out of our life that's going to make a difference for somebody else. And I want to have that overflow in my life to where I don't even really have to preach to anybody necessarily. And I'm not talking about like I'm doing tonight, but when I, when I go to the drugstore or when I go to the grocery store, I want people to know that there's a difference in my life. And I believe it's my job as a minister to teach you the whole counsel of the Word of God, but particularly to know about the wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit when Jesus ascended, he said he was going to send the Holy Spirit, and he said, you're actually going to be better off if I go away, because when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus could only be one place at one time, because he was in a body like we are, but the Holy Spirit is in all of us, working through all of us, all the time, everywhere, all over the earth. No wonder Jesus said, you'll do the things that I've done, and greater things than these shall you do. One of us alone may not do greater things, but all of us working together as one can do greater things than even Jesus did because the Holy Spirit is in all of us working. So we want to obtain and be filled with and led by the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, this thing about being led by the Holy Spirit is a pretty major thing. And I can tell you, I was a Christian for many, many years. And I mean, even one who loved God and went to church regularly, and I didn't know anything about being led by the Holy Spirit. Nobody, I was led by me. I was led by Joyce, what I wanted to do. And that's called carnal Christianity. That's what Paul was talking about when he was talking about people that were carnal. But when we learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads us out of bondage into victory. He shows us what to do when we have problems and situations. He leads us in great, big, spiritual, major, life-changing decisions. And he leads us in little, tiny, everyday things that wouldn't probably make any difference to anybody other than you. We need to have that kind of a close relationship with the Holy Spirit. So he said, I want you to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 22, 23, and 24. Abstain from evil, shrink from it, keep aloof from it in whatever form or whatever kind it may be. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, separate you from profane things, make you pure and wholly consecrated to God, and may your spirit and your soul and your body, now get that, may your spirit and your soul and your body, may your spirit and your soul and your body, one more time, may your spirit and your soul and your body 
be preserved sound and complete and found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ the Messiah. And verse 24, faithful is he who is calling you to himself and utterly trustworthy, and he will also do it, fulfill his call by hallowing and keeping you. Now, I think if we're ever going to not be mad at ourselves most of the time, we have to understand ourselves a little bit better maybe than what we do. Because do you know that you can want two totally different things at the same time? One of them right and one of them wrong. And you think, what in the world is my problem? I want to get up and go to church tomorrow. I don't want to get up and go to church tomorrow. I don't want to eat that hot fudge sundae. I want to eat that hot fudge sundae. I want to forgive you. I want to stay mad at you the rest of my life. Well, what happens is this. These are our little friends this weekend. Body, soul, and spirit. Isn't that cute? We got a little light in the spirit. I thought that was kind of sweet. So when we're born again, this part of us, the spirit part of us, which is the deepest part of our being, is made holy. We're all cleaned up inside because God can't be anywhere that's not holy. So in order for him to come and live in us, he has to clean the place up before he can come and live in there. I like to say it like this. I like to say that when we're born again, we become pregnant with a seed of everything that God is. I love 1 John 3, 9. It says that we receive the divine sperm of Almighty God. We get a new nature. God comes to live in us. And we literally have everything that we need spiritually to grow and mature and be all that God wants us to be. So he says, I'll, I'll sanctify you, spirit. But what about this guy here, the soul? And then what about, see, we decked her all out. Isn't that great? <laughs> the body. And we, we didn't, couldn't find a way to do it, but actually the body just loves to do all, get all this on and then look at itself. <laughs> just, don't you love it? Probably half of this is my stuff. I don't know. Just... <laughs> Here, here's a little tag that says, I'm awesome. <laughs> and we go from I'm awesome to I'm stupid. I hate myself. I love myself. You know, all this. But this, this soul, I'm telling you what, I don't know what would have happened to me if I wouldn't have come to understand my soul and the way I was put together. And I learned this many, many, many years ago, actually reading books by a man named Watchman Nee because... I wasn't really learning it anywhere at the time. I was being told everything that I had and everything that was available to me, but none of it seemed to be working in my life, and I didn't know what in the world was wrong. I was hearing about the promises of God and how I could have all these things by faith, and I was just struggling so hard to try to do every message that I would hear when I was out hearing teachings. And finally, I understood that what the Bible says is mine initially is what I have in Christ. But if it never gets out of my spirit into my soul and ultimately wakes it, makes it all the way through my body to where people can see it, then I may be okay, but I'm not going to help anybody else. I'm not going to be able to do anything for anybody else. And so it was very helpful to me in understanding myself to realize that my soul, and we all have one, is my mind, my will, and my emotions. Your soul tells you what you want, what you think, and how you feel. It doesn't tell you anything about God. It tells you all about you. So your spirit can be leading you, say, to get up and go to church or to give away something or to apologize to somebody or do a favor for somebody. And so in this part of you, the new nature part of you, you really do want to do it. You love God and you want to do it. But then your soul says, I don't feel like doing that. I don't want to. And frankly, I don't think it's a good idea. After all, they really haven't been very nice to you. Why should you do that? So then all the reasoning kicks in about why you don't really need to do that. And then, of course, your body just wants to lay down and have a nap or watch a soap opera or <laughs> eat a donut or something like that. So you got to understand your body is only able to do what you train it to do.
It can't do anything else. It's just really kind of, to be honest, kind of stupid unless you train it and keep it under all the time. No wonder Paul said, I buffet my body. And let me tell you something, sisters. He did not say, I buffet my body. He said, I buffet my body. <laughs> Same spelling, emphasis in a different place. So it's very helpful to us to understand this. Paul described the same dilemma in Romans chapter 7. And if you've read Romans 7 verses 15, all the way through the end of the chapter, you think, he knows what I'm talking about. Because Paul said, what is my problem? The thing I want to do, I don't do. The thing I don't want to do, I do. And then it was like he got into this conversation with himself. So if I don't want to do it, but I'm doing it, then it must not even really be me doing it. It must be some other spiritual law that's working in me that's making me do it. And then he goes on and on and on, and he finally says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Oh, thank God, he will through Jesus Christ. So if we go back to 1 Thessalonians, he said, I will sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body. I will do it. I will fulfill my call by making you holy. We see that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible teaches us in Philippians 1, 6, that he that hath begun a good work in us is well able to complete it and bring it to its finish. Well, if God's going to do all this, but yet I've been saved 25 years and I'm still a mess. If I've been saved 25 years and I'm still a mess. I'll try this side. If I've been saved 25 years... Anybody know what you're talking about? Amen. Amen. Then something's wrong. <laughs> so, so what's wrong? I mean, God promised that he would do it, but if it's not happening, then what's the problem? Well, maybe you don't know how to lean on God's grace. Maybe you don't know how to really depend on him. Maybe you're trying to do it yourself. You don't know how to receive his grace. But then again, maybe we're not cooperating with or yielding to the Holy Spirit. I like to say all the time that we're partners with God. God has a part and we have a part. God won't do our part and we can't do his part. Amen? God won't do my part and I can't do his part. And I really get myself into trouble when I do try to do God's part. I mean, I tried so hard to change Dave and it just didn't work. <laughs> Amen? I tried to change my kids, and that didn't work either. We're always trying to do stuff that we can't do instead of doing what we can do and letting God do what we cannot do. That's called trust. God wants us to enjoy this journey. So what is our part? You know, I believe that our part is to learn how to let the Holy Spirit lead us. And when we sense the Holy Spirit leading us to do or not to do something, we don't have to fight with it. We just simply need to yield to the Holy Spirit. We just simply need to say, okay, <laughs> you're smarter than I am. Been around this mountain a hundred times. Why do I want to just insist on having my way and go around the mountain one more time why not just believe that you're smarter than I am, that you know what you're doing, and just let it go? But we're a bit stubborn, aren't we, sometimes? Aren't we just a little bit stubborn sometimes? Maybe none of you, but I know I'm stubborn sometimes. The Holy Spirit is the agent in sanctification. And when the Bible talks about sanctification, although we are already sanctified in spirit, it's talking about our complete sanctification. Spirit, so in other words, God wants to if, if I can just put it like this, he doesn't want to just be kept in this little spiritual box. He doesn't want to just live in this little Sunday morning spiritual box where we let him out on Sunday morning for 45 minutes and then walk away. And the rest of the week, we've got a bumper sticker on our car and a cross around our neck, but we do exactly what we please and what we feel like all the time. That's not God's goal for our life. His goal is that we feed our spirit man with the Word of God, which then begins to renew our mind, and then that Word begins to 
act in our lives. It changes our mind. It changes our will. And it begins to control our emotions. But it doesn't happen without us saying, yes, Lord, that's what I want in my life. You know something? God is a gentleman, and he's not going to push things off on us. We have to want it. And if you study the word sanctification, which is a, the same word as holiness, which sometimes when you talk about holiness, people get a little bit nervous, but actually the Bible says that holiness is a reward. It's actually a reward. When you are living a holy life, it's a reward because you don't feel guilty and condemned all the time about all these things that you're not doing that you know you should be doing because you know God told you not to do it or to do it and you didn't listen to him and now you're in trouble and feeling bad about it. Anybody recognize where we're at here? Okay. Everybody does, of course. So I'd like to just take a little liberty here to read you a little bit of the definition of the word sanctification from the Vines Greek Dictionary. So this is not something that I've just come up with. This is from the people who are supposed to know what they're talking about. <laughs> Don't you love to throw the word experts around? Well, this is from the experts. So sanctification means separation unto God. So first question I want to ask is, do you believe that you are separated unto God. You don't belong to yourself. You're bought with a price, the Bible says, paid for with a preciousness, the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and this cross that's up here, I actually asked them to put that there this weekend because I want to keep reminding people the price that Jesus paid for this freedom that we have when he hung on that cross and he suffered and bled and died and paid for our sins. Amen. And so I need to have some kind of response to that other than just spending my life doing exactly what I want to do. I always kind of like to say, you know, if God didn't need us for anything, as soon as we got saved, he'd just beam us up out of here and we'd go on to glory. But he needs us. We're the hands and the feet, the eyes, the arms, the mouth, the ears of Jesus. He's making his appeal to the world through us. So separated unto God, and then it says the course of life, or I like to say the lifestyle that is fitting for those who are so separated. So in other words, if we're separated unto God, then there's a lifestyle that needs to go along with that. So we can't just go to church on Sunday and then live this unholy, ungodly lifestyle all week. There's a certain lifestyle that we live if we belong to God. We begin to think different. We begin to talk different. We begin to act different. We forgive people who hurt us. We don't stay mad at them. We don't keep everything for ourselves. We actually learn to delight in giving. We're kind to people. We want to do things for people. It becomes a trademark in our lives to see how many people we can actually make happy. We're not selfish and self-centered all the time, just having ourselves on our mind. We actually believe that we belong to God and we get up every day and say, God, here I am. Show me what you want to do with me today. Show me what you want to do through me today. I don't belong to myself. I belong to you. I love what Jesus said. I have prepared a body for you. And that's the place we need to get to, where we are just a body, wholly filled and flooded with God, according to what Paul said in Ephesians 3.19. Let us be bodies, wholly filled and flooded with God. I'm telling you what, when you come to the point where you're not trying to do your own thing all the time, life gets so wonderful, it is absolutely amazing. Now, how many of you know what a stoplight is? You come up to a stoplight, and if the light's green, you get to go. And if the light is yellow, it's supposed to mean caution. It wouldn't be too wise to go through. However, most of us just think that means hurry up and get through before the light turns red. <laughs> and then if it's a red light, it means stop. Now, you know what? I believe that in our relationship with the Holy Spirit that we also have green lights, yellow lights, and red lights. <laughs> and we need to know when we're getting a caution, you better be careful about that when we're getting the go-ahead and when we're hearing God say, stop, don't do that. If you do, you're going to get in trouble. 
I want things to work right in my life, don't you? So we're sanctified. We're supposed to live a life that befits what we're called to. And then this definition is long, and it goes on and says a lot of other things, but I love this part. It says, this sanctification has to be learned from God as he teaches it by his word. And now listen to this. And it must be pursued by the believer earnestly and undeviatingly. So in other words, I'm not ever going to have it if I don't really want it. And I have to want it really, 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 really strongly. Now listen to this. Greek. Vine's Dictionary. This holy character is not vicarious. It cannot be transferred or imputed, but it is an individual possession built up little by little as a result of obedience to the Word of God. Now, let me put it like this. Do you know that you can catch disease, but you can't catch health? And you don't have, you don't have to work hard, and I don't either. Being unholy, it just kind of goes with the package. You can't just catch holiness. You can't just go to church and sit there and listen to me preach or listen to somebody else and preach and think that's going to make you holy. But you learn things and then you make choices according to what you've learned. And then little by little, day by day, character begins to change. You know, I was thinking about maybe a good way to say this, and I, and I like this. I said it, but I like it. What I have in my spirit, what I have in my spirit as a gift from God, now you understand you have everything you need in your spirit as a gift from God, bought with the blood of Christ. But that's where it's at. It's in your spirit. And that's where it'll stay if we don't learn to be led by the Holy Spirit and learn to cooperate with God. What I have in my spirit is not my character. It is my position in Christ. This is who I am in Christ. This has nothing to do with how I act or how I behave or how my life affects other people. So a lot of times when we hear preaching about what's ours in Christ, what's ours in Christ, we have to realize it is ours in Christ. But if we want it to really affect our lives and other people's lives, then it's got to get out here and start to control my soul and begin to control my actions. So I like this too. I said this, but I like it too. Matter of fact, I wrote very good on top of this one. <laughs> now listen to this. What I have in my spirit is what Christ has done for me. How I live my life is what I do for Christ. Amen. What I have in spirit is what Christ has done for me. But when somebody makes me mad and my emotions are going wild and I don't want to be kind to them anymore and I want to gossip about them and I want to tell everybody what they did, but I'm getting a red light. Are you all with me? I'm not losing you, am I? And I'm getting a red light in my spirit. No, no, no. I've heard the word. I, I've been there when the preacher taught on forgiving people. I've heard that message 20 times. Now it's time to do it. Amen? You know, we are so over-educated in the church. Sometimes I don't think we need one more message. We just need to start doing some of the ones that we've already got. Amen? Well, you know, we all have times when we have difficult decisions to make. So what I would like to suggest is that when you have a very difficult decision, go to God, pray about it, ask Him what you should do, and then listen. You may not hear words from God, but you will get an understanding in your heart of what you should do. The Bible calls it the still, small voice. I always say it's a knowing. We know in our hearts what God wants us to do. You know, a lot of times we want to be positively sure of everything. Well, I suggest that you just take a step in faith, see how things work out. They work out right, then take another step. You know, if you take a step and it's not working, you can always step back and pray some more. God will not lead you astray. He does have a plan for you, and He sees beyond your present situation. Trust His leading and be bold in the Lord.
I'm always amazed when we come to a medical clinic that we can come out to a, a field or something that there's absolutely nothing and it becomes a well-oiled machine of, of medical care. How long have we been doing this? Uh, this is our 100th outreach. That's and, awesome. Uh, I want to see it's close to 10 or 11 years. Walk us through how this process works for your team. Patients, they come in and uh, they, they wait in line. Um, from there, they'll go in and wait some temps and see a, see a nurse for, for triage where they'll ask their primary chief complaint. Um, what's the one main reason that you're here? How, how can we help you? From there, they're afforded the opportunity to either see a doctor or a dentist completely free of charge. Um, from a doctor, we ask every single patient that comes in, uh, can we pray for you? And then from there, once they exit, they come here and they receive uh, free medicine. Describe for someone watching at home what you see out here on a regular basis. What is it like? Some have the same our patients at home have, but we also have rare diseases we don't see in, uh, in Europe. And uh, I also have the experience that the patients here are very um, humble, they are very thankful, and um, they, they have the hope that you bring them some help. Uh, there was a man who was coming because he said he cannot see properly. So um, we tried glasses, and I really uh, loved this moment when he put on the glasses, and I could see that he gets really happy, and then he just said, I can read. And I was like, just didn't want to freak out totally, but yeah. <laughs> and to stay professional, yes, and yet you're yes. so excited for yes. what's happening. That's awesome. Are people impacted for Christ through what you're doing here? Yes, I think so, because um, I do that because I love Jesus. I think they feel it, and yeah, sometimes we just pray right at the investigation table, <laughs> just to make them know that Jesus is the doctor all above us. Yeah. Here at the medical clinic, we are seeing many people getting help that they've needed for a long time. And our wonderful volunteers here, they work so hard, and we're just so grateful for all of you that make this possible. So right now, let me just ask you to be a part of everything that we're doing. Your special gift today can help lives in ways that you can never imagine. But together, we can make a big, big difference. So call us right now, go to the website, joycemeyer.org, and give a special gift today that will help people, not only here in Africa, but all over the world.